right, good afternoon, Web Summit, and thank you for having me. So I want to start by asking you all a question. What do you think about when you hear the term quantum computing? For me, I think about this. Humans are by our nature insatiably curious. We have a deeply rooted desire to understand our world around us. And for hundreds of years, scientists and engineers have been pushing past unknowns and inventing new technologies, also that we could continue to deepen our understanding of the world. And it's no different for quantum computing. About 100 years ago, scientists started to realize that our understanding of how matter worked was incomplete. What they traditionally thought of as particles sometimes behave like waves. And what they traditionally thought of as waves sometimes behave like particles. So for example, electrons. People think of electrons as particles. But if you put a beam of electrons through two slits, what you'll find is they create an interference pattern, which is normally attributed to waves. And if you think of light, which we normally think of as waves, well, light is made up of packets of energy, which can be absorbed one at a time, which makes it sound a little bit like particles. So scientists realized that the more they knew about an object's particle-like properties, the less they knew about their wave-like properties and vice versa. Over the following few decades, scientists started grappling with this idea of entanglement. So imagine that I have two photons that I create at exactly the same time, and I send them in opposite directions. And some period of time later, I measure something about them, but in totally different places and at exactly the same time. And what I measure could be different in the two cases, but when I compare notes later, I find that the results are correlated. But they're so strongly correlated that it couldn't possibly have been explained by those two particles having predefined properties the whole time. So over the course of the next few decades, the, the cornerstones of quantum mechanics were really laid. And in a discovery in the 1960s by Charlie Bennett and some of the other pioneers of the field started asking the question, can we actually use quantum mechanical properties for computation? Can we create a theory of information that would allow us to use the properties of quantum mechanics to compute? And if we could, would it be more efficient than other forms of computation? And what they discovered over the next few decades was that the answer to those questions was yes. We can actually invent a theory of quantum information, and we can actually use it to imagine solving problems better and more efficiently than it by any other means. In 1981, there was a conference that was jointly organized between MIT and IBM. And at that conference, a famous quote came, was made by Richard Feynman. And he said at that conference, nature isn't classical. So if we want to make a simulation of nature, we better make it quantum mechanical. Simulating quantum mechanics is one of these problems that's notoriously difficult to do using today's classical machines. But if we could simulate a quantum system on a quantum system, we could do that much more efficiently. Another example of a problem that is notoriously difficult to solve is factoring. So imagine I take two huge prime numbers and I multiply them together. Well, the multiplying part is easy, but now if I take that product and I try to refactor it back into its primes, that's an enormously difficult problem. Because there's not a better way to do it than to say, is it divisible by two? Is it divisible by three? Is it divisible by five? And the larger those starting prime numbers, the longer that's going to take. Well, in 1994, Peter Shore published a very famous algorithm that showed that that problem could be exponentially faster to solve on a quantum computer. So enthusiasm and excitement about this field was building up. I mean, there was suddenly this idea that we could start to solve problems we could never solve before. But there were so many other unanswered questions, like how do we correct for errors in these systems? Our classical machines have errors too, right? But we, we know how to correct for them. That's a problem we've solved already. You just duplicate the information, and then you look at all the copies of the information, and you say, do they match? If they don't match, then you have an error, and you can correct for it. Well, you can't do that with quantum information, because as soon as you measure the quantum state, you destroy it. So a whole new theory of error correction was required. And then by the end of the 1990s, in 1996, David DiVincenzo, who at the time was a researcher at IBM, published a set of criteria where he said, if we actually want to go build a quantum computer, this is what it's going to take. We need to create a scalable array of qubits, where qubits are our carrier of quantum information. They're our quantum analog to classical computing. We need to be able to create a scalable array of qubits, and you need to be able to initialize them in a ground state. And then there's a set of operations you have to be able to perform on them that are analogous to classical logic operations, like AND gates and OR gates. 
there's a quantum analogy to those, right? So you have to be able to create a scalable array of qubits. You have to initialize them. You have to be able to manipulate them in certain ways. And you have to have the information live long enough to compute something. That's called coherence time. And you have to be able to make a measurement. So over the course of the 1900s, the theory and the groundwork for what this field would later become was really set. So I want to take a minute and sort of explain to you some of the concepts of quantum computing. And I'm going to use an analogy to classical computing, and I'm going to use an analogy to a penny, right? So classical information, we process zeros and ones. So the penny analogy is we process heads and tails, right? So a single penny can be either heads up or heads down. If I have two pennies, they're going to be in one of four possible states. Three pennies, one of eight possible states, right? But the point is that at any given point in time, you're only ever in one of those states. So what's the quantum analogy? Well, with quantum, you can actually be in a combination of those two states. So imagine now, instead of just having a penny face up or face down, I can spin my penny. And while it's spinning, it's actually in a combination of heads and tails. Now, if I stop my penny, it's going to have to choose. Is it heads or tails? But while it's spinning, it's actually in a combination of the two. And so one penny can be in a superposition of two states. Three pennies can be in a superposition of eight states. And the idea is that the more qubits you have, the number of states in your superposition scales as 2 to the n, which means every qubit that you add and you put in a superposition, the state space goes as 2 to the n. Now, what about entanglement? So imagine now I have my two spinning pennies again. And in the classical world, if I stop my two pennies and I look at one of them, it's totally unrelated to what I would observe for the second one. But if I entangle my pennies, then when I stop them both at the same time and I look at them, if I see that my first penny is a heads, I know my second penny is going to be a heads. And if my first penny was a tails, my second penny is going to be a tails. Entanglement creates this way that the pennies are actually connected to each other and behave as a system. So let's take a step back and think about how would we even use these things to compute, right? So going back to David DiVincenzo criteria, I take my qubits, my pennies, and I initialize them as all heads, right? Now I spin all my pennies, right? So I've taken my qubits and I've put them all into a superposition. And then that's just what you do before you encode the problem. Then you actually have to ask a question. You have to encode your problem onto the quantum computer. And the act of doing that entangles some of the pennies. It applies a phase on some of the, on some of the pennies. And that allows you to actually create quantum interference, right? So you systematically uh, manipulate your quantum state until the final state represents your solution, and then you do a measurement. So pretty different form of computation. It's really a totally reimagined way that we could process information. So while the 1900s really laid the groundwork and the foundation of the theory of quantum information, the early 2000s up until present was really about a revolution in our ability to actually go and build systems like this. So in 2001, we demonstrated that we could experimentally factor the number 15, which seems like a small number to factor, but we could factor the number 15 using nuclear spin qubits, which is amazing. And over the following few years, the idea of a circuit-based approach to quantum computing emerged. So circuit QED was invented at Yale, and in 2007, the transmon qubit was invented. And this is the kind of qubit that we still use today in the best systems that we have available to us. And it's a, the qubit we choose because of its, in, its insensitivity to noise. And by 2012, coherence times, or the amount of time that the quantum state and the quantum information can last before it decoheres, it had increased by five orders of magnitude compared to the late 90s. So much so that by 2016, we demonstrated in IBM that we could make a quantum computer available in the cloud for free to any, for anyone who wanted to access it and leave it online for over two years. So in 2016, when we put a quantum computer in the cloud, we demonstrated a few things. One, these systems could be stable and left alone and people could program them. And two, we demonstrated that they work as expected as a quantum computer, which is amazing. So this, observe, this ability, this milestone, really represented a time where people started to believe it would be possible to really build and scale these systems to the point that we could start so solving problems we could never solve before. And in 2017, when we launched IBM Q, it was really to transform that possibility into a reality. So you're probably wondering what these things look like. So this is a picture of one of our processors with eight qubits. Each of the squares represents a qubit. And these, these qubits are actually macroscopic. You can see them with the naked eye. They're about a millimeter on dimension, which is amazing, because they behave like an atom. They behave like something where you can manipulate its quantum mechanical properties. And what you also see in the picture are these squiggly lines. So these squiggly lines are microwave resonators. 
They're how we communicate with the qubits, and they're how we have the qubits communicate with each other. So if we want to entangle two qubits with each other, we use these resonators. And what's amazing is that we cool these things down to 15 millikelvin. That's 100 times colder than outer space. And the reason we do that is to shield these, these qubits from any stray radiation or noise that could interfere with the quantum state and decohere our information. And that processor sits at the bottom of an apparatus like this. This is a picture of a dilution refrigerator, which is how we get these things so cold. And that processor sits inside of the copper can you see on the image on the right. And there's many layers of shielding that protect that processor from any stray radiation. And those cables that you see coming down are the microwave coaxial cables we use to talk to the qubits. And we button it all up in one of these cylinders. And you can see the electronics rack in the back, which is how we send signals in and out. And if you want to get a much closer look at the dilution refrigerator, we have uh, a model of it at the IBM Q booth in Pavilion 2. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of flavor for really what's happening at the cutting edge of research for the next few slides. So in general, I mentioned at the top that there's, there's problems that we know these systems, or we have reason to believe these systems will solve better than classical computers. Some examples are simulating quantum mechanics and factoring. But factoring re requires a universal fault-tolerant quantum computer, which is a long period of time away from now. So the question is, what can we do with near-term hardware, the kinds of hardware we're going to have in the next five to 10 years? And we've been studying this. And over the last year, we've published a number of results that show we can use quantum computing for machine learning. We think we can use quantum, um, quantum classifiers to be able to perform binary classifications. And we can use entanglement to actually improve the accuracy of our classification. Another thing we can do is we can simulate bonding in small molecules. So this is a paper that we published last year that showed we could simulate molecules up until about the size of beryllium hydride using a quantum computer. And we could also map optimization problems onto a quantum computer. If you can define a cost function that you're trying to optimize, you can actually translate that cost function onto a quantum computer. And not only are we exploring the cutting edge of applications, but we're also exploring the cutting edge of error mitigation. So I mentioned also at the beginning that error correction it was a theory that had to be invented for quantum computing. But even fully error, doing error correction fully requires that we have more than 10 times the number of physical qubits to actually do it. So how do we go about mitigating errors now using the hardware we have available today without requiring such a huge overhead on qubits? And just earlier this year, we showed that there can be a technique that you apply using the exact same hardware that can get you from this higher error situation to a much better error situation. So that's really at the cutting edge. And in the last few weeks alone, we demonstrated that there's a mathematical proof that shows that even near-term hardware is going to have an advantage for solving certain kinds of problems compared to classical machines. Until a few weeks ago, there was no proof mathematically that we could expect these near-term devices to have an advantage for certain kinds of computations, but that changed a few weeks ago, which is very exciting. So I also mentioned at the top that we think it's a pretty important thing that we've made these quantum computers available to the world for free through the cloud. And I want to justify that a little bit. I want to tell you why we think that's important. So the first reason is because of the enormous acceleration in the rate of research progress in this field. Over the last two years, there's been over 110 publications that our research community, the extended research community, has published leveraging the hardware that we've made available to them. And this research spans all kinds of interesting disciplines. It spans quantum applications and studying what we can do with these systems. It spans benchmarking. We need a set of benchmarks that we apply across all kinds of qubit technologies. Number of qubits isn't enough because qubits are different from each other. So how do we benchmark these systems? How do we actually automatically map the problems people want to solve onto the hardware that we have available today? All kinds of interesting studies about entanglement and, and so on. So, as the research community makes faster progress, this is a tide that rises all boats. You know, so accelerating research is really um, one of the key reasons why we think this was an important thing to do. Another thing that we think has been really important is that from an educational point of view, this has had a major influence on students. So if you imagine being an undergraduate taking your first quantum information class, right, before two or three years ago, you were going to learn everything theoretically. And maybe you would have a simulator that you could use um, to study quantum information concepts. But now you have a real machine. Suddenly, it's a lot more real to you. You can run your experiments. You can try out what you're learning really in real time on a real machine. And that's been very exciting for students. And there's a photo in the background of the slide of Sarah Sheldon. 
and she was visiting her alma mater in, in uh, University of Waterloo Institute for Quantum Computing, and she saw firsthand how different it was for these students to be able to actually try out what they're learning on a real machine. It makes a huge difference, and you can explore at your own pace. And we have a number of other partnerships that we have with universities that use our systems for educational purposes. And finally, the third kind of most important reason that I think that this has been important is what it's done to democratize access to this really new technology, right? So you don't have to be a research scientist, you don't have to be an undergraduate studying this discipline to be excited by this field. So, you know, all of you in this audience, maybe you're not a research scientist or a student studying it, but you're interested, right? So the fact that all of you, in a matter of moments, could take out a smartphone and run a real experiment on a quantum computer is a pretty amazing thing. And just earlier this year, we, pa we passed 100,000 accounts that were signed up um, on the IBM Q experience in over 160 countries and over 5 million experiments have been run on this platform. And the thing that really unites our, our community is Quizkit. So Quizkit is the world's most successful and widely adopted framework for programming a quantum computer. And it's useful across all types of backgrounds, right? So if you're a research scientist and you want to publish at the cutting edge of the field, you use Quizkit because the amount of control it gives you over different aspects of the system. If you're a student and you want to learn, you can run your first quantum hello world using Quizkit, right? So Quizkit has multiple layers. You can get involved at Quizkit Terra, which is right at the ground level, at the circuit level, where you're defining the exact experiment that you want to run. Or you can get involved at the Quizkit Aqua level, which is the application level. And we've prepackaged a bunch of quantum algorithms and applications so that anyone can just pick one up off the shelf and try it out. And in fact, within Quizkit, in the GitHub repository, we also have made available a number of uh, tutorials and examples that we've worked out, including making available Jupyter notebooks that would let any of you go back and rerun some of the experiments we ran that got the cover of Science and Nature in the last year. So in addition to just building out Quizkit, we've also built a number of tools that we think are going to help our community. So one of these tools is a plugin for the popular code editor VS Code. So if any of you use VS Code for development, you can now just get a plugin that is going to give you some features like autocomplete. It's going to give you a bug detection mechanism. It's going to give you inline documentation and a lot of other really cool features. So again, this is the kind of, the kind of thing that would help you if you're writing really serious code in Quizkit to find those typos that you typed, or even just launching a quantum hello world, which you see here. So I sort of want to conclude by inviting all of you to get involved. So earlier this year, we predicted that within five years, quantum computing is going to stop feeling so esoteric and like a field that's only for physicists. This is a field that's rapidly accelerating. It's very early in the history of quantum computing. And there's all kinds of disciplines that can actually contribute to the development of this field. Everywhere from physics to computer science to applied math to electrical engineering to chemistry, material science, even design. So I want to invite all of you to get involved. And you can do so by visiting this URL and joining the Quizkit community. And you can also feel free to come and talk to us uh, after this at the IBM Q uh, booth in Pavilion 2. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.